From routine to superstition, and from discipline to the borders of insanity, we explore some of the great literary voices and their structured madness. Welcome to House of Words, a podcast about writers, routines, and willpower. I'm your host, Jason Nemoa Hardin. Join me as we kick off the new year with a peek into the various routines and schedules of writers. Quote, in short, you may actually be writing only two or three hours a day, but your mind, in one way or another, is working on it 24 hours a day. Yes, while you sleep, but only if some sort of draft or earlier version exists. Until it exists, writing has not really begun. A statement made by John McPhee. On episode 52, we took a dive into the controversy that was Henry Miller's Tropic of Cancer, but what we didn't go into was the work schedule while writing the book during the years 1932 and 1933. At the time, he had certain commandments he used to keep himself aligned and focused. These were, I quote, 1. Work on one thing at a time until finished. 2. Start no more new books and no more new material to Black Spring. Three, don't be nervous. Work calmly, joyously, recklessly on whatever is in hand. Four, work according to program and not according to mood. Stop at the appointed time. Five, when you can't create, you can work. Six, cement a little every day rather than add new fertilizers. Seven, keep human. See people, go places, drink if you feel like it. Eight. Don't be a drought horse. Work with pleasure only. 9. Discard the program when you feel like it, but go back to it next day. Concentrate. Narrow down. Exclude. 10. Forget the books you want to write. Think only of the book you are writing. 11. Write first and always. Painting, music, friends, cinema, all these come afterwards. He also did his best to stay true to a daily program. In the morning, if he felt groggy, he instructed himself to type notes. If, in his words, he was in fine fettle, he would write. In the afternoon, he would work on the section at hand, following his plan of working section by section scrupulously. There would be no intrusions and no diversions. He would, quote, write to finish one section at a time, for good and all. In the evenings, he instructed himself to let loose from the restraints of writing and instead see friends and read in cafes. He would also encourage himself to explore unfamiliar sections of his town, on foot if wet, on bicycle if dry. He wrote, write if the mood so struck, paint if empty or tired, make notes, make charts, plans, make corrections. However, and this one is important, he also specified to allow sufficient time during daylight to make an occasional visit to museums or watch a movie at the cinema, as well as a visit to the library for references once a week. Now, let's take a leap over to the world of comics, where we can learn a little bit more about how the legendary Alan Moore plots his stories. Moore explained in an interview that when he first began writing comic book scripts, he lived in a state of terror that he would on some occasion get to the end of a story and not have an ending for it, or that the ending wouldn't be a satisfactory one. For this reason, from the get-go, he would plot his stories out almost to the finest and most minute detail. If he was plotting a 24-page Swamp Thing story, he would first start off with a rough idea of where he wanted the story to go in his head. He would have vague ideas of what would make a good opening scene, a good closing scene, and a few muddy bits in the middle. Then, he'd write the numbers 1 to 24 down the side of a page, and he would write down a one-line description of what would be happening on each page. 
This structure would grow to the point of mania with his unfinished graphic novel, Big Numbers. Big Numbers was plotted in its entirety as a projected 12-issue series on one A1 sheet of paper, which he felt was frightening. A1 is scary, he would say. It's the largest size. He divided the sheet of paper along the top into 12 columns, then along the side into close to 48 different rows across which the names of all the characters were written. In essence, it became a grid from where he could tell what each of the characters would be doing in each issue. Now, after working on it for a while, it would soon be all filled with tiny writing, which, according to him, looked like the work of a mental patient. It was like migraine made visible. It was really scary, he said, and added that he mainly did it to frighten other writers, including Neil Gaiman, whose face drained of color when he saw the towering work of madness he had orchestrated. However, as time went on, and after numerous meticulously plotted projects, he began to get the feeling that, in certain genres, the heavy plotting techniques had its flaws. Sure, if you're writing something like a crime story or a whodunit, a tight plot is very important, even necessary in most cases. But often, the plots read as just that, plots. They didn't make for interesting stories. He didn't feel himself pulled in by any of the characters because they merely seemed to be there in order to push the plot further, not telling an interesting story. He did not want to make the same mistake. The risks connected with taking stories to different places and leaving the heavy plotting behind naturally came with the confidence of experience as well. The longer he's worked on stories, the more he'd felt entitled to deviate and follow his gut instinct, which has paid off more often than not. Quote, Once you know how all the stuff works, then you can throw away the rule book. You can just throw away the manual and then sort of just do it. You know, improv. Well said, Alan Moore. Now, another great writer who knew a thing or two about building a story was the one and only James Baldwin. In one very astute quote, Baldwin said, Forget about talent. Sweat your heart off. Talent is insignificant. I know a lot of talented ruins. Beyond talent lie all the usual words, discipline, love, luck, but most of all, endurance. Now, his mantra was that you don't give yourself an alternative or a way out. Because once you realize that you can do something, it might be very difficult to live with yourself if you don't do it. And that's how serious he thought one should take the task of writing. It should be something that irritates you and won't let you go. There needs to be an element of anguish in it, a feeling of, do this book or die. That's what he felt you needed, and he didn't just talk the talk, he practiced what he preached, and not only when it came to writing, but even during yoga, especially balancing poses. Yoga. Uh, perhaps that's quite random here, but it just demonstrates his being a stickler to his methods. He would tell his body, look, you don't have a choice other than standing on one foot. Falling is not an option, so focus and shut up. And it would work, because the alternative of not doing the pose was not appealing to him, as it wouldn't get him anywhere. So he chose to sacrifice comfort for a more rewarding gift, the gift of balance and success. He felt that the point of writing was showing and not describing or telling. He would say that all his books were overwritten to begin with, which is why the rewrite was an act of cleaning the text, with the final point being not to describe, but show. He would say, That's why I try to teach all young writers, take it out. Don't describe a purple sunset. Make me see that it is purple. Like many other writers, he argued that the first draft was far from sacred and that thinking so only harms the product. Anything and everything should be played with and screwed with until it reaches its full potential and has exhausted all the ways it can be reset. 
Although he did a lot of rewriting, that doesn't mean he found it to be an easy task to do. It was very painful, but its importance outweighed the pain. He would know it was finished when he felt he couldn't do anything more to it. He also accepted that it would never exactly turn out the way he wanted it to either. The goal of writing was not to make the perfect piece, but rather discover corners of yourself that you ignore. By writing and rewriting and working on a piece, he found how much he learned and in particular how little he knew. Again, that is not to say that any of this comes easy. Having to strip yourself of all disguises, even those you didn't know you were wearing, is not an easy feat. But in order to write the truth, or how Baldwin put it, to write a sentence as clean as bone, it was a necessity and ultimately the goal. According to Mr. Baldwin, sticking to the aforementioned disciplines results in the discovery of wonders and treasures that exist inside you. We all know that discipline and tenacity are two of the most important factors of a writer, proven time and time again to work. Now let's take a look at the late great Aldous Huxley, who was known to start his day early. First, he would share a breakfast with his wife before he began working uninterrupted until lunchtime. After lunch, the couple would go for a drive or a walk before he would return to work again from five to seven. Then they'd have dinner. After dinner, his wife would read to him until almost midnight. Now, due to an eye illness early in life that left Huxley with very poor eyesight, he relied heavily on his wife to do many activities, which included reading to him as well as often typing his manuscripts. It was even reported that she'd cut his steak for him at dinner. A routine and a set of expectations for a day of writing are important for anyone who hopes to create something that will be worth the time of the reader, and more importantly, worth the time of the creator. Quote, A writer who waits for ideal conditions under which to work will die without putting a word on paper, as E.B. White once so eloquently put it. In an interview with the Paris Review, E.B. White the famous author of Charlotte's Web and Stuart Little, talked about his daily writing routine. Maybe you'll find some similarities between yourself and Mr. White, or perhaps you'll find something to inspire you. Quote, I never listen to music when I'm working. I haven't that kind of attentiveness, and I wouldn't like it at all. On the other hand, I'm able to work fairly well among ordinary distractions. My house has a living room that is at the core of everything that goes on. It is a passageway to the cellar, to the kitchen, to the closet where the phone lives. There's a lot of traffic, but it's a bright, cheerful room, and I often use it as a room to write in, despite the carnival that is going on all around me. In consequence, the members of my household never pay the slightest attention to my being a writing man. They make all the noise and fuss they want to. If I get sick of it, I have places I can go. A writer who waits for ideal conditions under which to work will die without putting a word on paper. End quote. Maybe the heart of the house is the place where the heart of the writer resides. That is, of course, up for you to decide. Now, other writers have arguably pushed their strict routines to the edge of what we consider to be sane, applying a routine on themselves that only works for them and very few others. A perfect example of this is Haruki Murakami, who once wrote, The repetition itself becomes the important thing. In a 2004 interview, Murakami discussed his physical and mental habits, saying, quote, when I am in writing mode for a novel, I get up at 4 a.m. and work for five to six hours. In the afternoon, I run for 10 kilometers or swim for 1,500 meters or do both. Then I read a bit and listen to some music. I go to bed at 9 p.m. End quote. He would keep this routine every day without variation, working on the belief that the repetition 
was the most important element of it. He referred to it as a form of mesmerism and a way for him to mesmerize himself in order to reach a deeper state of mind. But to hold to such repetition for so long, six months to a year, requires a good amount of mental and physical strength. In that sense, writing a long novel is like survival training. Physical strength is as necessary as artistic sensitivity. It is easy to conclude that most aspiring authors are not as steadfast in their writing routine. Well, what can I say? Different rights for different types. Even well-renowned writers are curious to how other writers create their oeuvres. A good example of this is the interaction between George R. R. Martin, best known for writing the Game of Thrones series, and Stephen King, who needs little to no introduction. In an interview from 2016, Martin asked King bluntly, How the fuck do you write so many books so fast? Adding, I think... Oh, I've had a really good six months. I finished three chapters, and you finished three books in that time. King answered, Here's the thing. Okay, there are books, and there are books. The way I work, I try to get out there, and I try to get six pages a day. So with a book like End of Watch, and when I'm working, I work every day, three four hours, and I try to get those six pages, and I try to get them fairly clean. So if the manuscript is, let's say, 360 pages long, that's basically two months' work. But that's assuming it goes well. Martin followed up, asking, And you do hit six pages a day? King replied that he usually does. Martin then asked, You don't ever have a day where you sit down there and it's like constipation? And you write a sentence and you hate the sentence, and you check your email and you wonder if you had any talent after all, and maybe you should have been a plumber. You don't have days like that? King then answered, No, I mean, there's real life. I could be working away and something comes up and you have to get up, but mostly I try to get the six pages in. Now, just in case you are interested in getting more familiar with Stephen King's routine, I would advise you to check out Episode 7 of House of Words, where we go deep into the circumstances surrounding King and his novel Pet Cemetery. However, if you wish to know some of his routines later on in his career, in his sober days, I should add, well, they go as such. And I quote, I have a glass of water or a cup of tea. There's a certain time I sit down, from 8 to 8.30, somewhere within that half hour every morning. I have my vitamin peel and my music, sit in the same seat, and the papers are all arranged in the same places. The cumulative purpose of doing these things the same way every day seems to be a way of saying to the mind, you're going to be dreaming soon. Moving right along, let's take a look at author Joan Didion, who in an interview in 1968 explained how she creates for herself a kind of incubation period for ideas, saying, I need an hour alone before dinner with a drink to go over what I've done that day. I can't do it late in the afternoon because I'm too close to it. Also, the drink helps. It removes me from the pages. So I spend this hour taking things out and putting other things in. Then I start the next day by redoing all of what I did the day before, following these evening notes. When I'm really working, I don't like to go out or have anybody to dinner because then I lose the hour. If I don't have the hour and start the next day with just some bad pages and nowhere to go, I'm in low spirits. Another thing I need to do when I am near the end of the book is sleep in the same room with it. That's one reason I go home to Sacramento to finish things. Somehow the book doesn't leave you when you're asleep right next to it. In Sacramento, nobody cares if I appear or not. I can just get up and start typing. Another one who had rituals and, dare I say, superstitions 
was Jack Kerouac, which he described that same year in 1968. I had a ritual once of lighting a candle and writing by its light and blowing it out when I was done for the night. Also kneeling and praying before starting. I got that from a French movie about George Friedrich Handel, but now I simply hate to write. My superstition? I'm beginning to suspect uh, the full moon. He then added a few thoughts on the best time and place for writing. Uh, the desk in my room, near the bed, with a good light, midnight till dawn. A drink when you get tired, preferably at home. But if you have no home, make a home out of your hotel room or motel room or pad. Peace. Next up, we have Susan Sontag in her diary from 1977 as she attempted to get her thoughts in order and establish a routine for herself. This is edited for clarity, but mostly it's there. She starts by writing, Starting tomorrow, if not today, I will get up every morning no later than eight, can break this rule once a week. I will have lunch only with Roger, can break this rule once every two weeks. I will write in the notebook every day. I will tell people not to call in the morning or not answer the phone. I will try to confine my reading to the evening. I read too much as an escape from writing. I will answer letters once a week. Friday? I have to go to the hospital anyway. Then in a Paris Review interview nearly two decades later, she detailed her routine. I write with a felt-tip pen or sometimes a pencil on yellow or white legal pads, that fetish of American writers. I like the slowness of writing by hand. Then I type it up and scrawl all over that and keep on retyping it, each time making corrections both by hand and directly on the typewriter until I don't see how to make it any better. Up to five years ago, that was it. Since then, there is a computer in my life. After the second or third draft, it goes into the computer, so I don't retype the whole manuscript anymore, but continue to revise by hand on a succession of hard copy drafts from the computer. She also told how she would write in spurts, saying, I write when I have to because the pressure builds up and I feel enough confidence that something has matured in my head and I can write it down. But once something is really underway, I don't want to do anything else. I don't go out. Much of the time, I forget to eat. I sleep very little. It's a very undisciplined way of working and makes me not very prolific. But I'm too interested in many other things. Our another bestseller to spell out his routine to the Parish Review was Don DeLillo in 1993. I work in the morning at a manual typewriter. I do about four hours and then go running. This helps me shake off one world and enter another. Trees, birds, drizzle. It's a nice kind of interlude. Then I work again, late afternoon, for two or three hours. Back into book time, which is transparent. You don't know it's passing. No snack food or coffee, no cigarettes. I stopped smoking a long time ago. The space is clear, the house is quiet. A writer takes earnest measures to secure his solitude and then finds endless ways to squander it. Looking out the window, reading random entries in the dictionary. To break the spell, I look at a photograph of Borges, a great picture sent to me by the Irish writer Cullum Toybin. The face of Borges against a dark background. Borges fears, blind, his nostrils gaping, his skin stretched taut, his mouth amazingly vivid, his mouth looks painted. He's like a shaman painted for visions, and the whole face has a kind of steely rapture. I've read Borges, of course, although not nearly all of it, and I don't know anything about the way he worked, but... The photograph shows us a writer who did not waste time at the window or anywhere else. So I've tried to make him my guide out of lethargy and drift into the other world of magic, art, and divination. Now, just in case you found many of the routines mentioned somewhat deflating and hard to live up to, let's wrap this episode with some words of inspiration. In a 1975 interview, 
Pulitzer Prize winner Bernard Malamud, one of the most prominent figures in Jewish American literature, sums up the truth behind finding your perfect daily routine. Quote, you write by sitting down and writing. There's no particular time or place. You suit yourself, your nature. Eventually, everyone learns his or her own best way. End quote. Thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and will spread the word about the podcast. Once again, I have been your host, Jason Nimore Harden. We here at House of Words ask that you please consider helping to make this show easier to produce and more frequent by contributing on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash house of words or paypal.me slash house of words podcast. Alternatively, you can subscribe and encourage others to subscribe to our YouTube page at House of Words Podcast. Every little bit helps more than you might think. And with that, the year is already on the move, and we are still in January. So we'll say Happy New Year. Until next time, keep turning those pages. House of Words is written and produced by Crystal M. Sanchez. Narrated and written by me, Jason and Moorharden. And music by Creature Nine and Wood. All rights and ownership belong to Crystal M. Sanchez and Jason and Moorharden.